you and honor you today for you're so worthy, you're so glorious, you're so mighty, you're so wondrous. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We love you and thank you for this day. Your many blessings, your hand upon us, your spirit leading and guiding us. Father, as we say every service, we say it every service and regularly because sing your word. We know that you've got a plan for us individually in our lives. You've got a plan for this service tonight, Father. Things that you want to say, things you want to do. And we desire, Father, to accomplish your will, plan, and purpose for your word says... In Psalms 127, verse 1, Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain that build it. And I thank you tonight, Father, that you know each and every heart in this place. You know what they need tonight, the word from your word. They need the anointing of the Holy Ghost that must be present and yielded to, Father, in order to bring about your plan in their life, in order to ensure they're equipped to accomplish what you've called them to accomplish. And, Father, we know that you know tomorrow better than we know today and yesterday. So we're just yielded to you, and I thank you as the pastor here tonight that I'm yielded to the Holy Spirit. Uh, the ears of my spirit are perceptive to his voice, and I thank you now as I yield myself that the words that I speak will not be man's plans, thoughts, or ideas, because they'll benefit us little to none. But they're going to be your words, Father, directed and anointed by your spirit. And Father, I believe, as well as I have, these people have come tonight expecting by faith to receive something from you and father as they come expecting to receive and now as the word of god by the spirit of god is delivered that combination together father them not only being hearers but doers as well the course of their life will be changed challenged and altered forever never to be the same again for the better they're going to walk in the blessings of god be attentive to your voice follow your direction father and we thank you that the best will be yet to come in their lives as they obey you. Now we thank you for these lives changed, but as, as, as important as that is tonight, Father, to you as well as to us, we thank you, Father, ultimately, that all is said and done in this place tonight will give you the glory, the honor, and the praise for it all. We thank you now by faith in advance. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. You can be seated at this time. Thank God for the Word of God. Thank God for the Spirit of God. Go to Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. This is actually, we actually just started last week, uh, series, whatever you want to call it. I don't usually know if they're going to be for a week or six weeks, but either way, we get started and follow that flow until the Lord changes it. But even though that is one of our text scriptures, Galatians chapter 6, we didn't start in the beginning. But I have something else that is very urgent that I must say now, cannot hardly even pray or focus in, until I do, because you want to hear what the Spirit of God's saying, right? Yeah. Amen. So, and of course, that's the way that I pray. I always remind God, you know, that, that I know without a question that myself as a pastor, as a minister of the gospel will be ineffective without my proper fellowship with Him, without me listening to the Spirit of God and being in tune, because only He knows your heart what you're facing and what you're dealing with. In and of myself, I do not know that. Even if you tell me some different things, which nobody has to my knowledge, I'll only know what you tell me, unless the Spirit of God reveals it. And as a pastor, sometimes he does. But again, he doesn't tell me anything, uh, I mean, excuse me, everything about anybody. So I must be in tune with the Spirit of God in order to be effective. And I want to say a couple things here before we get started. It is instruction. Is that all right with you? Galatians 6, verse 1, brethren, now who's he talking to? If he says brethren or children, he's talking to the, the children of God, Christians. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, considering thyself, lest you also be tempted, bear ye one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. But he says here in verse 4, let every, every man prove his own work. Whose work are you to prove? 2 Corinthians thirteen five. I think we mentioned it Sunday, says examine yourselves. Who are you to examine? But at the beginning of the service, when I begin to pray, excuse me, when I begin to pray in my office, not the service, but for the service in my office, these are the words that I got. The Holy Spirit said, you go to chapter 1 in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, 
Galatians 6 verse 1. And these words just kept coming up. Matter of fact, that's how it started. This is specifically for somebody in this place. Considering thyself. You need to consider yourself. Now, in, in that same flow, look at Romans chapter 14. Because he said this as well. We'll put it all together here in just a second. We trust the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 14, verse 1. <clears throat> Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Three, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Verse 4, that's what the Holy Spirit said, to emphasize, who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Listen, the first person that you need to judge is who? The first person that you need to consider your ways, as, I, as it says there in Galatians 6, but in Haggai as well, we ministered a message several months ago on consider your ways. We need to consider ourselves. Amen? He said, who art thou that judgest another man's servant? There's somebody here, and there's just a, there's, I, I'm glad that you're here, but some of our crowd's not here. I don't know who this is for or who it applies to, but you're holding something in your heart towards somebody. And this is one of the things the Holy Ghost told me because I'd forgot about it. And I do that often because I don't try to remember it. The Lord said to remind you that he used me to say the same thing just a few weeks ago. And you didn't listen. Now I don't know if the Lord operates on three strikes and you're out. So I'm not teaching and preaching that. But he said just to remind you he's already told you let it go. And now he's saying again today whatever it is your first responsibility you consider yourself. You judge yourself you examine yourself let the other man answer to God let the other woman answer to God God will take care of them amen and even if somebody's sideways and in sin if Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 is true you being a person of God that is spiritual right your goal is going to be restoration and repentance anyways not to go home and talk about it and feed on it and fester over it and balance if you are a person of authority and you have people working for you, you don't just let stuff go. You make allowances to some degree, but you're not only there to guide, but also to correct as necessary. And you guys that work for people and are under authority, that is their job and you're to submit to their authority. So if you are under their authority and they come and tell you, do this, do that, or the other, and you tell them, Pastor Jason said, go to Romans chapter 14, who are you to judge me? They're your authority. And if you tell them that, you might get fired. So you understand there's a balance in this thing, right? And it operates the same way with God. Now, that's not my message. It's not a message because the, the Lord said it's not. But he said, just to remind you, and the few words that I would leave you with, he said, because you already know. As I've said this, you already know by the Spirit of God that he's talking to you because he's dealt with you about it more than one time. And he said, remind them that I've already used you to say it one time in the same church. And I'm having to say it again because they didn't listen. The way we get into trouble with God is when we don't do what he instructs us to do. Because everything that God instructs us to do is for our good, not to hurt us. Amen? Even if there is correction. Now, we're going to move along getting the message. We started last week. The title of the message, and it's very, very good because it's the Word of God, is called Keep the Faith. Keep the faith. And we started out, I'm not going to do hardly any review, but the CDs are free. You can get them after church. They're in the bookstore of, of every message. But, of course, this one was started last week. God is not in the giving up business. Amen? God is not in the, the quitting business. There's only one being who is constantly pressuring you to give up. And who is that? He come to steal, kill, and destroy, right? He's your adversary. He's your opponent. He's not your advocate as Jesus is. He's your adversary, and he's your opponent. He's constantly pressuring you to give up. He wants nothing more than through introducing adverse circumstances and situations to get you to give up on God's plan, right? 
<clears throat> and very often, again, not getting deep into these things, we covered them some last week, but there's a mentality, especially today, that the only way that I'm going to do this, that, or the other is if it's easy. When you live in this world where Satan is the God of this world, not our God, right? The moment you make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of your life, you live in this world, but you're no longer of this world. Your father is no longer Satan. Your father is God, right? So we understand that. But us being children of God, living in this world where he's our father, but Satan is the God of this world, you're going to face opposition. Any preacher on Facebook or church that you go to that says it's going to be easy each and every day is simply no nice way to put it. They're lying to you. It's not true. You're going to face opposition. You need to be prepared for that. And we want to understand what to do to keep the faith, to stay strong in the faith, to no matter what comes our way, we're going to be like Daniel in the lion's den. No matter what God has to do, as we trust him, he will see us through. Because all things are possible to him that believeth, but it doesn't say that all things are possible to he or she that gives up and quits when it gets hard. Amen? We forfeit the blessings of God when we choose to be disobedient to God's will and to God's direction for our life. Now, does that mean that you cannot ask God to forgive you and get back in the flow? We're not teaching you that. But we are teaching you how to keep the faith. You, if you have sinned and missed it and you ask God to forgive you from your heart, God does what he says he would do. He's faithful and he's just. Amen. If he was not a merciful and a forgiving God, none of us would be here. Right. But in, in the context of this message or for the purpose of it, we are assuming that your heart's desire is to obey the word and, and follow the leading of the spirit. And your goal is to make Jesus Christ your aim and accomplish what he's called you to in this life. You understand that. If you have missed it and you say, well, I might as well just give up because I've missed it. No, you repent and ask God to forgive you and you still have the same aim, right? And you just get up and go again. Everybody in here that would be honest has missed it and come short of the glory. Amen. I know that I have a, at least a couple times <laughs> since this morning. Amen. Maybe y'all have arrived. I hadn't arrived yet. God's still working on me. Amen. And he's working on you if you allow him to. But it's not always going to be easy. And if it is easy, it's probably not God's plan. And the reason being is because Satan will always provide opposition to whatever God calls you to do. You know, no matter how many people, even in your life, that get excited when you get a hold of God and you're pursuing his plan, you can rest assured that when you get on the plan and the path and the flow, we would say, that God's called you on, you cannot expect Satan to throw a party with them because he's not going to throw one. He's going to do everything he can to throw a kink in God's plan for your life, right? And he, he uses trickery and different tactics and schemes and traps. Why? Number one, the Bible says that's how he operates, so we know it. Number two, he cannot take you at will. He has to get you to, instead of keep the faith, give up on the faith. He tries to get you to a place where for a long time you said, I know it because God said so. And then things will begin to look in this way and that way and the other way. And instead of saying the bottom line is God said this, I believe it and that settles it. You, get to, you start saying this, well God said it but. God did say that but then this happened. But then that happened. But then the other happened. So I, I, I was sure it was God but now circumstances, situations, things are not lining up. Like I should, well, you need to know if God's instructed you to do what you're doing tonight, that you're where you need to be tonight, again, doing what you're doing. But the reality of it is this, you know, are those things, are, th are you facing opposition in your life because you're out of God's plan? Or is the reality that you're facing opposition because maybe you are in God's plan and right where you're supposed to be and the enemy is opposing you? If that's the case, you simply walk in the authority you've been given in the Word of God. Amen? You remember Jesus. we just jump off. Go to Matthew chapter 4. Amen? We use this often. You probably all know it. But you know, Jesus, if the Bible's true, and we know it is, Matthew chapter 4, we'll start in verse 1. Jesus was tempted in all points like you and I have been tempted, right? And he overcame. He never sinned. He overcame, now he's our example, he overcame and he paved the way we would speak and now we walk the path and walk in that authority that we have in his name, in the word, right? 
So let's look at Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. This particular temptation, and if we know the whole context, context, we understand that God placed Adam and Eve. He placed his man in the garden in the beginning. There, he was created, Adam was, man was to have dominion. There was no sin, no shortcomings, no failure. There was none of these things, right? Everything was like it was supposed to be. Everything was like God created it, and, and he had created that with entered into a covenant with his man Adam, Right? And we know that for a period of time that, that they, they were successful and they were uh, naked and unashamed. There was no sin conscious. There was no guilt conscious and all those things. We know that he fellowshiped with, with God in the, in the garden daily, right? They did. But then he told them which tree not to eat of. And the moment they disobeyed, things changed, right? So God's man, Adam, what happened? He failed. And, when, and we talk about, you know, how we became sinners. Well, God's man Adam failed, and then every man after, every woman after, was born from his family. So you, in reality, became a sinner. You and I became sinners the same way Colin became a Smith. That's his last name. The same way I became a Wallace. Just because you was born into this world, you were born into sin. But see, Adam messed things up, but thank God in his love. Amen. For God so loved the world, right? He gave His only begotten Son so that whoever believed in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. And the purpose for Jesus was, Jesus was not born of man. Jesus was the only begotten Son of God, right? He was born of a virgin. Amen? Innocent, sinless, sacrifice. He wasn't born into sin, and He never sinned. So, but there were some things that were necessary in the life and ministry of Jesus even opposition, even hard times. Obviously, we know he ended up being crucified here on the earth. He's not dead now, but he was crucified when he left this earth, right? So we see that right here, this is, this is necessary. What Jesus is doing by the will of God, being led up of the Spirit into the waters, be tempted of the devil, this is a making right what Adam made wrong through sin and disobedience. Adam, under pressure, under temptation, deceit, guile from Satan, whatever you want to say, Adam failed. Jesus, we'll see here, did not. Right? But even in this situation, now, now I'm not trying to be trickery or twist things on a rightly divide the Word of God, but I'm trying to make a point. Just because you're facing hard times doesn't mean that you're not in the will of God. And a lot of people, every time it gets hard, they change gears or they change direction. And we've seen it for years, ever since we got into ministry, probably before, but I didn't pay as much attention then, obviously. But it gets hard over here, and today they're sure it's God, and then it gets a little bit hard, and they're going to jump here and jump there. And you don't need a bunch of ideas. You need to know what God's told you. That's what you need. What has God said? What steps has God told you? So he hadn't told me to do anything different than what I'm doing right now. Then you keep doing what you've been doing. Amen. God's not playing hide and seek. He knows where you're at. And, and the word says in James 4, 8, when you draw not to him, he'll draw not to you. Right? In Jeremiah 33, 3, Jeremiah 33, 3, he said, if you call upon me, I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not. Amen. God has our answer and he is our answer. But we see Jesus here in one of many trying times, times of opposition. Right? And, and again, let's, let's, there's a purpose in everything. I can't teach you all of it tonight for two reasons. Number one, I don't know it all, so I can't teach you for that reason. And number two, I don't have enough time. If I did know it all, y'all wouldn't stay that long. And I wouldn't blame you, not that long. But you're safe because I don't know it all anyway, so you are. Right. But we'll read it one more time for the third time. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Right? Now we know that God does not tempt anybody with evil. But here he's being tempted of the devil, but he's led there by God. And Brother Andy says it this way. I like the way that he's always said this for years. I think he said it the last time that we were at AFI. He said a lot of people think that God was sicking the devil on Jesus. And he says that's wrong. The reality is, is God was sicking Jesus on the devil. Right? So it's, it's a lot of times in rightly defining the word and rightly discerning is how you look at things. 
Then verse 2, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. Have you ever noticed with the devil? He always knows right when to show up. This is something that I quit saying a long time ago, and if you say it, you might want to stop. I'll tell you what, this is about all I can take. I can't handle no more, don't say that. Because <laughs> when you do, you're fixing to find out. Because you know some of these, you see these trucks on the road and the forklifts and the mills and stuff, when they're backing up, beep, 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 you know. As soon as you say, I just can't, I can't handle another thing, this is all I can, the devil puts it in reverse. And you start hearing beep, beep, beep. You say, why? Well, he's just going to see what you're going to do. Amen. Amen? It's a test of your faith. It's not coming from God, right? You keep the faith in the storm, and then the only thing that happens to your faith, faith in the storm in an opposition, if the Bible's true, and it is, I believe it's in 1 Peter chapter 1, we go down 5, 6, and 7 or so there, we would see that the only thing that happens to our faith in the storm is any impurities that are there will be removed, so you only come out stronger when you trust God. We're not ministering a message of failure. We're ministering and encouraging you to keep the faith and don't give up, right? And, and, and when he was fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungered. And that's when, who came? And when the tempter came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. I didn't plan on saying none of this at all. But this is all good. I'm getting all this by revelation, believe it or not, as I speak. I hope it's as good for you as it is for me. I've read this a few hundred times, but this is just coming as I go. When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones, stones be made bread. Everything that, that Satan uh, tempted Jesus with here, these three different things, he could have done every one of them. And people would say, No, nah, he couldn't do this and he couldn't do that. That's not true. He could. Listen, just because you can some, do something does not mean you should. And it does not mean it's the will of God. Amen? And, and it hasn't been recently, but everywhere I've been, I've heard people pray this way about jobs and about people and about positions and about all sorts of things. They say, well, I'm just going to believe that if, if God opens a door, I'm going to know it's him and I'm going in. That's wrong. Don't do that. That's like Gideon putting out a fleece. We don't put out fleeces. We're led by the Spirit of God. Realize that Satan's the God of this world. He can open some doors. Don't go in every door that's open. There might be death and destruction on the other side, but if you listen to the Spirit of God, I'll be honest with you, a lot of times you'll have ten doors open and you know inside you're not supposed to go to none of them. Amen? If you're looking for a way out under pressure, Satan will provide it every single time. Keep the faith. Right? But he said here, Jesus answered his response was, it is written. What are we going to stay anchored in? What are we going to meditate on day and night? What are we going to hide in our heart that we might not sin against God? Sin missing the mark. Yes, the Word of God. <clears throat> it is written, <clears throat> man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. All right? So he dealt with what Satan said. He responded. He answered him. But did Satan quit? Mm -mm. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city, setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If you be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. Listen, did you know to a degree that Satan knows the Word of God? That's why I tell you, you'd be so careful who you follow. Because some of the people that can make the Scriptures sound like a fairy tale. And yes, God's Word is good. But just make everything sound like a fairy tale, they take the Word of God and pervert it. And what they know people don't want to hear, they'll never breathe a word about it. Even though it'll be a word that'll change people's lives. Amen? Be careful. He, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. You got the picture. Satan takes Jesus up into a high place, mountain, pinnacle, and is showing him all of these things. Vast, prosperous, right? Very often, we mistake money and blessings and doors for the Spirit of God and God's direction. Amen? If you go back and follow the children of Israel, one of the biggest things that they did was... They walked in the blessings of God in many different times of certain degrees. And what God corrected them about was they got focused on the wrong things and they forgot God. 
we had to be careful that no yes god wants us blessed but i think it was sunday morning as we have been discussing and teaching god never wants you blessed at the expense of your relationship with him amen he's first and then out of that we seek god first and then amen a lot of people are working against themselves they don't even know it they're working themselves to death and don't have time for God. Well, you're working to acquire something that is only taking you further away from God. So the reality is, is God's not in it and he's not going to bless it. When if we would slow down and seek God's face and put him first, our steps would be deliberate. They would be decisive. They would be calculated, not even by us, but by the Spirit of God. Because he said in Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. We have taught you recently, in, in not the Greek, but the Hebrew, lean not to your own understanding. That word means your own insight. That word means also in the Hebrew, it means good sense. There are things that would make good sense to you and everybody around you that is not God's direction. It doesn't matter if it makes good sense. What is God saying? Amen? What is God saying? That's what matters. What is God saying? Now, so he said, he took Jesus up, showed him all of these things. You can have these, but see, uh, Satan, only if there's any blessing, that's really not the right word. I guess you could say naturally, not spiritually. If there's any blessing or anything that comes from Satan, trust me, it comes with a great price. Amen? He said, how do you know? Let's read it. He taking him up into an exceeding high mountain in verse 8, <clears throat> and, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou will fall down and worship me. All the, you can have all of these things, and many would say, I, can't, I, I don't feel led, I can, but, but I don't feel led to teach you on this right now. But many say, oh, no, 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 all those things belong to God. This is not a reality. Uh, Satan could not have, gave, yes, he could gave him those things. He could so. Because the moment that Adam sinned, that's why we need the Old Testament. We do. I never tell anybody to throw the Old Testament away. But we live in the New Testament. Because in the Old Testament, it is a picture of man separated from God. And I know there were all the sacrifices and such, and there was communication through the priest, prophet, and king and such. I understand that. But after sin, it, what you see mainly in the Old Testament is the need for a Savior. In the New Testament, the Savior has come. Amen? Now you have him. He's seated. He's come. He's lived. He's died. He's rose again on the third day. He's took your authority back. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, right? Pulling for us today. But at this moment in time, and Jesus had to overcome this test, this temptation, right, to make right what Adam made wrong. Through disobedience, Jesus was obedient. But Satan became the God of this world. Remember, Adam was the God of this world, we would say. Until Adam disobeyed God, he gave that authority. He gave that dominion and those rights to Satan. So Satan offered him all of these things, and he said, if you'll bow down and you'll serve me, listen, this is good revelation. Whatever your price is, Satan's willing to pay it. Now, that doesn't cause people to get excited and dance in the Spirit, but we need to understand these things. I've seen people go all kinds of places and do all sorts of things only to be like this in their life. Everywhere. Everywhere. Because whatever door's open, that's got to be good. No, those that are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God, right? Thank you, Lord Jesus. God's good, amen? And he saith unto them, verse 9, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Jesus, again, obviously, we know the book, he had the right answer. He said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Get behind me, it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, in him only will thy serve. So we see these three different areas that there was a temptation in and all from Satan. And, and what happened? Jesus stood on the word of God, spoke the word, acted the word, said it is written. And then what happened? Get thee behind. He said that. Get thee hence. And then verse 11. Then the devil leaveth him and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. The devil cannot stay in our lives unless we allow him to. We've been given authority over him. We've all been guilty of times by allowing him to come and set up camp in our lives and in our homes by sitting around meditating and thinking on and, and doing things, you know, that maybe we shouldn't. But it is a time that we exercise our authority and we kick him out in the name of Jesus. 
We serve notice on him. We say, Satan, you've got no place, no power, no authority in my life anymore. I do not belong to you, and I'm not going to live for you. I belong to God. I'm his child, and I'm only going to do those things he instructs me to do, be the person he tells me to be, go where he tells me to go, whatever it may be, I'm following his steps. And you say, well, the will of God is the word of God. Yes, this is where I live daily, right? We understand that. Amen? So we said a lot. I don't want to say to say nothing, to say nothing in my notes. We said a lot that's very valuable. Go back to Galatians chapter 6. I, I don't know if I told you that or not. But Galatians chapter 6, we're going to back on up to verse 7. Verse 7, we'll look at just a few things here. It is God's will that we walk in the authority that he has given us, that we do not allow the enemy. You know, I, I know what I said a while ago by the Spirit of God. And in the beginning, it was so true about letting it go. But this is also by the Spirit of God what we have stressed here. Because, again, I hadn't thought about any of these things till I got up here, honestly. None of this that I've mentioned is in my notes. Zero. I haven't even read one scripture, I don't believe, off my notes yet. <clears throat> but also, and I didn't get this earlier, but by the Spirit of God, don't take any steps that's not directed by God that you're not sure. If you don't know, don't go. I said, if you don't know, don't go. No, you'll know, and when you know, you'll go, right? Because when we get up here sometimes and say, well, you shouldn't quit this and you shouldn't quit that. If God tells you to move, if God tells you to leave, if God tells you to change jobs, now you get over in the Word, you say, well, God's telling me to change my spouse. Well, then he lied to you because that's not what the Bible says. You're in covenant. If you're in an abusive situation and being battered and such, we believe without question uh, legal separation would be proper and right, and we're all for that. You do not need to be in a volatile uh, situation, but this, you know, people do the same thing with the things of God. They get in a situation, they say, well, you know, I just don't like them anymore. We're falling out of love. You know, things are not like they used to be. Well, we're there for the good, and we're there when it's not always easy, Right? <clears throat> it's covenant relationships but we want to be led by the spirit of god but what i was saying is 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 if you are obeying god then then you're not necessarily quitting or giving up you can actually quit something and keep the faith as long as it's god's that's instructing you to do so amen what we're talking about is not being moved by the situations and circumstances that the enemy introduces in your life in an effort to get you to give up right you understand that You'll notice this, and again, this won't cost you any extra, but we're tithing and giving into the church at the obedience of the Lord. You begin to tithe and to give, and, and you know, you already have those thoughts beforehand, before you do get built up in the faith. You know, my Lord, I'm, I'm barely making it off 100%. How in the world can I make it off a of 90? And you already have that mentality, maybe, but then you get the word in you, and you step out and start tithing and start giving, and then it gets harder instead of better. Well, you've got circumstances and situations, but the reality is they're not coming from God anyways. And what enemy wants you to do, Satan wants you to do, is to release the word. Because if you release the word and you have a spiritual abortion, we would call it, and you abort your faith. Because living for God, this is critical, all of this tonight is. This is not something that we try. Amen? And we count, uh, yes, that's, that's the word that, that, that Colin just said that I got on my notes that I don't believe that I, I will get to. This is a lifestyle. Amen? And, and not knocking anybody, but even today, for everything. We want to go to the doctor and get a pill. And, and pop a pill, and you say, were well, you against medicine? Dependency upon it? Yes. There's different situations and circumstances. The doctors can help you get back to a place you need to be. We're not against uh, doctors or, or medicine or such. None of those things, and that's a reality. But we want to just go and, well, I'm going to get a pill and take this a couple times a day, you know, and I take it for a week and everything will be all right. We, we don't live for God that way. Amen? We don't say, well, I, I came, I, I tried church. I came to church for two or three times and didn't just have this feeling. We don't live by feelings or we'll be up and down all around. I am committed to God with everything that I have. And as I say that, even as I say it, and as you're looking into the mirror of the Word, I know today that He does not have all of me. And, and anybody that's pursuing God knows what that means. Because the more that you give God, and the more that's your aim, the more the Holy Spirit through the Word will every day show you, okay, there's more. There's more available, and there's more things in your life that are hindrances. And again, God reveals every hindrance in my life through His Word and by His Spirit, not to hurt me, but so that the power, the, the fruit of the Spirit, the blessings of God, so that everything can flow. 
God wills us to be blessed. He's already given us the greatest gift that he could ever give us in giving Jesus Christ. I've had people to, to tell me at different times and, and knowing the word a little bit, it would almost offend me. Is, you know, I've had one individual to take their checkbook down and they've been tithing and giving and throw it on the table and they said, you know, I need God to give me a sign. I need God to do something and give me a sign to prove that he wants to bless me because I don't see it. I need him to prove it. I, I can see him right now doing it. They were bad, mad about their situation. They wasn't, it wasn't even directed towards me. Not that it would have mattered if it would have been. But they said, I need a sign. And immediately it just come up in my spirit. You, he doesn't have anything greater to do than he's already done. He doesn't. He's already given Jesus. If he gave you a billion dollars next day for a sign, it wouldn't be nothing compared to what he's already done. He wants us now to take him at his word. It is us, we have to understand, it is us forfeiting the blessings of God by giving up on God's plan and God's word when it doesn't look good. Amen? Because as we minister this in balance, we must also understand, I mentioned earlier, Satan can do no more than we allow him to do. Amen? We have authority over the devil, over all the power of the enemy. You and I have authority. He is our adversary. He is our opponent. He is walking about. As a, not a, he is not a roaring lion, but as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. When we're rooted and grounded in the Word of God, we got the ears, not naturally, but the ears of our spirit in tune and perceptive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. You know, we know who our Father is. We know who our Shepherd is. And it doesn't matter what other voice comes. We'll know that's not God. And you'll have times in your life where 50 other people will say, oh, oh this is God. And you'll know. You won't necessarily say or attack anybody. But you'll know no, that's not God. And then they'll have to go find out the hard way, this way, that way, the other way. But you... Another unpopular thing, but true, is you and I, even if we have missed it a half a million times, we don't have to miss it. We can pray and seek God's face and get God's direction in our life. If we would spend, again, I, I didn't plan on saying none of this, but Brother Andy Greer went to a church one time. I hadn't thought about any of this stuff until I got up here. But he went to a church one time, and he said, I don't necessarily like it when this happens. You know, he's an evangelist, but he went up to the church minister on that Sunday morning and this was he was prepared for the services but on the very last minute the pastor said our evangelistic team witnessing team is meeting this morning and I want you to speak to him before you go out and preach and obviously he's been praying about the service and he did it but he said I would rather kind of of knew ahead of time instead of the last minute and he said Lord that's the last thing on my mind right now I got this message to minister of course I, I want people to get saved and such and I, I want to help them but that's not my thought and he said the Holy Spirit told him just one little phrase he said don't tell them anything else he said just tell them this one little phrase because I want it to stick he said if they would spend 90 percent of their time praying and praying in the spirit ahead of time and 10 percent going out and witnessing to people and praying for people they would have 100% success. And that was, it was, he's actually shorter than that. But there was just one little statement. And he said that they realized immediately where they got off because they was going and doing repeatedly, but they were not being fruitful because they were not spending time in prayer and being directed by God. And we're not directed by God. We can be doing things, but be unfruitful and unproductive. We don't want that. That's when you get tired and discouraged and frustrated. You want to know that you know that you know that you're in God's plan. Amen. But very often we get too busy. But Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If I do not like, we discussed this in finances, but we want to. it doesn't just work financially. It, we use it all, all the time in the offerings. But we reap what we sow, right? If we do not sow, we do not reap. We don't focus on the reaping. Why? Because the reaping is the fruit of an action of a decision the reaping is the result if I do not like where I'm at in my life or what results that I'm getting what I need to focus on is not the results I'm getting I need to focus on what I've been doing right I could say well I don't have any peace in my life I don't have any peace at my house I don't have any peace you know at my job as far as, as far as I'm concerned well we have a right to have the peace of God everywhere we go so we have to ask ourselves you know who or how did I let my peace get stolen? I had to look. You remember Peter? We said this last week, I think, in Matthew 14. Peter, when they were in the storm, wind whipping and all kind of stuff, and, and we know that Jesus was walking on the water, and, and G Peter said, Jesus, if that's you, you know, bid me to come. And Jesus said, yeah, come on. Peter got out the boat, and he was walking on the water so long as his focus was right. 
Amen? But the Bible says that he saw the wind boisterous and became afraid. So from, as his focus was right and he was looking, see, God doesn't want us bogged down. God doesn't want us weighed down. He wants our spirits renewed every minute of every day, right? But he was in faith as long as he was looking at the author and finisher of our faith. But when he allowed the circumstances, Satan will bring different storms, situations, circumstances in your life. Amen? And we say, well, people are my enemy. The reality is, is that people sometimes yield to the enemy and, and, and then you're still the enemy who's trying to get my attention off of the author and finisher of my faith. And then when Peter got lost his focus, then, then what began to happen? Amen. And people say, well, Peter got out the boat. Yes, and, and he should be commended for that. But many of us have got out the boat. I have found this out. It's really not that hard to start anything. It's not that hard to start. You can about start anything at any time. But then when it gets hard, but then when there's opposition, you know, and we, we see this often, it's been that way for years. When it comes January at the gym, I just about don't even want to go. And, and when I'm going to the gym, I'm fairly faithful, I don't even want to go. Because everybody just about starts in January. I mean, it's just, they run all the deals because they know they're going to get all kind of people. They've already started 45 times, 45 different years in a row, not picking on nobody, but they're lucky if they make it to January. And you got all the old timers in there. Some of them's not quite as old, but all the old timers in there. And they say, oh, just hang on a few more weeks. You'd be able to work out on the machine you want to. So very often starting is not the problem. But those individuals in the gym, I can think of a few of them right now, the, the older fellows, they always, they had the understanding, this isn't something you're going to do for two or three weeks. This is a lifestyle change. It's going to be continual decisions in this direction. If we're going to follow God, He's going to be our focus. He's going to be our focus. His Word is going to be our focus. And we're going to be listening to what He's saying by the Spirit to our spirits. When it's good, when it's bad, when it's easy, when it's hard. Again, I'm not knocking anybody that's ever give up or quit or failed or anything because nine times out of ten, all of us have. But the goal is, as you come to church on Wednesday night and Sunday morning and study your Bible, I hope, daily, to be built up in the Word so you can be who you've not been. You can go where you've not gone. And you can succeed, succeed where you failed before. Right? That's why you're here. So we understand how to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Understand that it's not us in and of ourselves. His grace is sufficient. Right? In our greatest times of weakness. God has a plan for you, and He has a plan for me, but we have a part in whether it comes to pass or not. He that soweth to the, his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary. When I got this message, and I'm not going much further tonight, not for sake of time, but, but believe it or not, I, this is the first scripture that I have read out of my notes, so we read this at the end. We would say we do things backwards around here sometimes, but honestly, we just want to follow God. Amen? And if we follow Him, it doesn't matter if it seems backward to us. And honestly, if I wouldn't tell you, you wouldn't know what's on my notes or not anyways. And, and let us not be weary. This is the past. This is Scripture right here in verse 9 that God gave me to, to start this message. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Let us not be weary. Don't grow weary. Don't allow fatigue to set in. Don't get your eyes focused on the storm and the opposition. Let us not go weary in well-doing. Let us not say, you know how when you, you know, I'm going to cover some more of this next week, I think. But you know how when you, you, you maybe been out of shape or need to lose some weight or whatever, and you get on a good diet plan that you know works, and then three days after, or maybe just two days, you jump on the scale and you're so frustrated. You took 50 I mean, you took, you took a year to gain 50 pounds, and we want to lose 20 in three days. And can't figure out what in the world. Oh, my God, I thought this thing was working. Oh, I just knew if I did this, it was going to work. It will work if you got the right plan. Many Christians have decided this wasn't the right plan because it didn't work in their time frame. It didn't work how they thought it should work. And really, how they, when they thought it should work. God is working when you see nothing going on, when you have prayed in faith and you're obeying this word. You don't need to see anything. You don't, 
has any, am I the only person in here? I know that I am not. That you have been praying and set your faith for something. And maybe you got to the point that you was just about to give up because it looked like it wasn't not only nothing happening, it looked like it's getting worse. But I tell you this all the time, then I go back to God and pray about it. You know, not doubt and unbelief, but just checking myself with the Spirit and the Word. There's nothing wrong with it examining yourself. That's not doubt and unbelief. To pray and say, God, if I'm doing something to cause this problem, please show it to me. That's not doubt and unbelief. That's the wisdom of God. Amen? And sometimes He'll show me. You've been doing this, that, and the other. Whether you realize it or not, it's causing you a problem. You need to ask me to forgive you and go ahead and, and fix it. There's been times with Laura Lee and my wife that I, that I absolutely knew that I was wrong about different things and I need to apologize. There's been other times, even since we've been here, that I've been in the church praying about stuff, and the Lord said, I want to do this in your life, but you have said or acted this way toward Larley, and so help me to the good Lord. When he said that, I did not even know what I did. Now, that's not all the time I usually know when I'm wrong, but I did not realize that I had been doing this. And he said, the reason that you've been getting this response, even from Laura Lee, is because of what you've been doing, and I'm telling you to stop now. And I, of course, endeavor to get it straight immediately. Amen? Because he is my father. And he loves me. And he corrects me. But sometimes when I go to him, I'm going to finish along these lines. When I go to him, I've been believing, been praying, been seeking God. It looks like nothing's changing and maybe getting worse. Sometimes this is what he says. Because I already heard from him months or years ago. He says, what I tell you. That's all he has to say. Why? Because I already know immediately. He doesn't have anything else to say. What he's telling me is you stand on what I promised you. And I'm not the only one that's been in this situation. Not only have you prayed and sought God's face, put your trust in Him, and it didn't stay the same. It looked like it was getting worse. But then you kept the faith. And then everything turned around. And then after you received the fruit of your faith, you look back and you realized you got a revelation. All the time you thought God wasn't doing anything, He's working the whole time. He's right now, if you're trusting God, no matter what it looks like, over here that you don't see, over there that you don't see, over here that you don't see, and back here that you don't see. God is working and moving and putting the right people, the right place, the right time, the right provision. Don't be moved by what you see. Don't be moved by how you feel. Don't be moved by what other people do. You keep the faith and don't grow weary in well-doing because if you don't give up and you're in faith, if the Bible's true and we know it is, you will reap where you've sown and you do not sow to God and the spiritual and spiritual things and obey the word of God and not reap the blessings of God it doesn't work that way God is a God of his word don't give up don't give in and don't quit your best days are yet ahead of you as you trust him take him at his word act on it and be led by the spirit of God stand to your feet